like this. So here's the buzz. The microphone is gone from the room today. So I'll just have to shout, and hopefully everyone can hear me, and that'll work OK. Uh, but everyone in the back, you can hear me OK? Yeah, OK, good. So today, we're up to lecture 20, and we're going to continue our discussion of generative models. Uh, so this will be generative models part two. Um, so remember, last time, we started our discussion of generative models by recapping um, a couple big distinctions in machine learning that we need to, that we need to be aware of. So one of these was this distinction between uh, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So, that, so then you'll recall that in supervised learning, we have um, both the data, the raw data X, which is like our image, as well as the label Y, which is the thing we want to predict. And in supervised learning, what we wanted to do was learn some function that predicts the label from the image. And this has been very successful. This works well. This is, we've seen throughout the semester this concept of supervised learning lets us solve a lot of different types of computer vision tasks. But supervised learning, of course, requires us to build a big data set of images that have been labeled by people in some kind of label Y. So we'd like to figure out, so kind of one of these holy grail, holy grail problems in computer vision, or even machine learning more broadly, is figuring out ways that we can take, that we can learn useful representations of data without those labels Y. Which brings us to unsupervised learning, where we have no labels, just data. And somehow our goal is to learn some underlying structure of the raw data even without any human provided labels. And if we could do this, this would be awesome, right? Because you can know you can go out on the internet and just download tons and tons and tons of data. And hopefully, if we, did uns if we could do unsupervised learning in the right way, then we could just download more and more data. We don't have to label it, so it comes for free. And then we, our models can just get better and better and better. So this is kind of the, one of the holy grail challenges in machine learning. Um, and I think we're not there yet. But that's kind of one direction that we're pushing with generative models. So remember last time, we also talked about this distinction between distributive models and generative models. And this, is more of the, and this was about the probabilistic formalism that we use when building our concrete machine learning models. So remember that a discriminative model is trying to model the probability distribution of the output, or the label y, conditioned on the input image x. And that because of the way probability distributions work, we know that probability distributions have to be normalized. They have to integrate to 1. So then this, this, this constraint on probability distributions that they need to integrate to one induces a sort of competition among the support or among the elements of the, of the probability distribution. So then recall that when we're building a discriminative model, this means we have a competition among the different labels that the model might choose to assign to the input image. So for this um, input, uh, input image of a cat, then the labels dog and cat are kind of competing with each other for probability mass. And then remember that for discriminative models, this fact that the labels are competing with each other was a bit of a downside, because it meant that discriminative models had no way to like, reject unreasonable data. So if we gave this like an image of a monkey, then even though monkey is not a valid label, the model has no choice but to force the labels to integrate to one, and it still forced the model to like, output a full valid dist probability distribution over the label set, even though the image itself was unreasonable. So then, of course, with a generative model, what we were going to do is learn a, dis a probability distribution or a density function over the images themselves. And now, again, because of this constraint that density functions need to integrate to one, now, but now, the things that are competing with each other are the images themselves. So then, with a, de with a generative model, we need to assign a likelihood to each possible image that could possibly appear in the universe. And those, those, all, those, all, those, all those densities for all of those images need to integrate out to one. So that means that the model needs to decide, without any labels, which combinations of pixels are more likely to be valid images. And this uh, requires a very deep understanding of the types of, of, of visual data. So that's our generative model that we're trying to learn. Um, of course, we also saw the, this third option of a conditional generative model, which is trying to model the images conditioned on the label. And of course, we, we, we saw that we can use Bayes' rule to write out a conditional generative model in terms of these other components. Um, like the, 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 a discriminative model and in terms of a, an unconditional generative model. And later in this lecture, we'll see actually some, some more concrete examples of conditional generative models um, that are built out of, out of neural networks. So then after this kind of introduction, we saw this big taxonomy of generative models, right? That this, this idea of building probability distributions over our raw data is quite a large and rich area of research. And a lot of smart people have spent a lot of effort trying to build, build different sorts of generative models with different sorts of properties. So last time, we talked about um, one type of generative model, which is the autoregressive generative model. So then if you'll remember, in an autoregressive generative model, it's explicitly writing down some parametric form of this density function. 
So then if we're trying to model the, 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 the likelihood of an image X, we break the image X down into a set of pixels, um, X1 through XT, and then we assign some kind of order to those pixels. And we always say that the, prob that the, that the likelihood of a pixel is, um, is we, we write down a function that, right, that spits out the likelihood or the, the, the likelihood of a pixel conditioned on all of the previous pixels in the image. And this was just like the, the types of models that we had built for, for modeling sequences with recurrent neural networks. So remember that we saw this exact same, same type of model when, for example, doing image captioning or language modeling with recurrent neural networks. Um, but then with these, with these autoregressive models, then we wanted to kind of um, just model the pixels of the image one at a time, and we could use that either with some kind of recurrent, right, recurrent neural network, which gave rise to this pixel RNN, or this um, pixel CNN, where we, where we model this kind of dependence using a convolutional neural network over a finite window, rather than using a recurrent neural network. But in either way, um, we're either these, either these types of autoregressive models, what we're doing is we're writing down this parametric function with a neural network that is just directly parametrizing the likelihood of an image. And then we train the model by just doing a very straightforward maximum likelihood estimation. So we just want to maximize the likelihood that the model assigns to all of the training data. And in doing that, um, it'll allow us to then sample or generate new data at test time after the model is trained. So these autoregressive models we saw are kind of simple and straightforward. They're just kind of directly learning a density function over images and maximizing it on the training data. So then after we, after we saw these autoregressive models, we moved on to this, um, this more interesting category of generative models called variational autoencoders. So then in variational autoencoders, remember, we, we kind of lost something compared to autoregressive models, but we also gained something. So what we gain with respect to uh, with uh, autoregressive models is that in addition to modeling the likelihood of the data, we've also introduced this latent variable, z, which is supposed to um, be some latent representation that, uh, that assigns sort of characteristics, that, that contains characteristics or attributes of the data that are hopefully of a higher semantic level compared to the raw pixel values. And now with a variational autoencoder, what we wanted to do was learn a generative model that, could, could, that was, um, could produce images conditioned on this latent variable Z. But we found that in trying to like, manipulate the map, we saw that it was completely intractable to both, to, to just directly maximize the likelihood of the data once we introduced this notion of this, of this latent variable Z. So then last time, we saw that we, we kind of went through this long extended proof that, we could, that you could uh, look back at the slides. But at the end of the day, we derived this lower bound on the, on the data likelihood. So then well, remember that we have this data likelihood term on the left, which is or the log likelihood of the data on the left. And on the right, we have a lower bound on this data likelihood that consists of these two terms. Um, and in order to derive this lower bound, we had to introduce an auxiliary network called the decoder network. And this is, so then now our encoder network on the left here is trying to predict the, the likelihood of the latent variable Z conditioned on the image X. And now the decoder network on the right here is trying to model the likelihood of the data X conditioned on the latent variable Z. And where we kind of left off with last time is that we had introduced these two networks, and we used these two networks to derive this lower bound on the likelihood. And then remember what we're trying, going to try to do with a variational autoencoder is then train these two networks, the, in the encoder and the decoder. We want to learn the parameters of these networks jointly to maximize this lower bound on the data likelihood. Because we can't actually access, the, we can't compute the true likelihood of the data, but we can compute this lower bound. So then if maybe the true likelihood of the data is here, and this data likelihood is some lower bound, now we're going to train, the, train the, the two networks to maximize the lower bound. So then hopefully when we train these networks to maximize the lower bound on the likelihood, that will hopefully also in some um, indirect way also hopefully maximize the likelihood of the data. So that sort of that, then that this so then this lower bound on the on the slide here gives us our training objective for a variational autoencoder. So now um, when we had, we're talking about variational autoencoders, we need both of these both the encoder network and the decoder network. They need to input a piece of like a, on the, for the encoder, for example, it needs to output a probability distribution, which is a different sort of thing than we've seen with most of our neural networks. Right, so with the encoder network, it, we wanted to input a concrete sample of data X, and we wanted to output a full probability distribution 
over the potential latent variables z. And now, now, this, now outputting a probability distribution from a neural network is kind of a funny thing that we haven't really seen in other contexts so far. So then we, need to, we needed to do an additional trick in order to allow neural networks to have probability distributions as their outputs. So then the trick that we used is that we, de we, we, just, we just decided that the, all of these probability distributions would be Gaussian, um, and in particular would be diagonal Gaussian. And now we would train the encoder network to output both the mean and the diagonal covariance matrix of this Gaussian distribution. Um, and to maybe look at what, and then the decoder is going to be similar, that it wants to input a concrete sample of the latent variable Z and then output a distribution over the images X. And the way that we do that is again, just decide that this distribution is going to be a, ga a diagonal Gaussian. And we have the neural network output the mean and the covariance of, uh, and the diagonal covariance matrix of that Gaussian. So then to be a little bit more concrete, then if we were, we, we could imagine sort of writing down a fully connected variational autoencoder architecture to train it up on the MNIST data set, for example. So then if we were training on this MNIST data set, then all of our images are uh, grayscale images of size 28 by 28. So then we can flatten those to a single vector of size 784. And now we could decide that our dimension of our latent variable Z is going to be a 20 dimensional latent variable. And that, that dimension of the latent variable is of the latent, uh, that latent, that size of the latent variable z is a hyperparameter that we would need to set before we started training. So then a concrete uh, architecture for what this could look like is that the encoder network then needs, then inputs this vector x. It could pass through some linear layer to go from 784 down to 400 hidden units. And then from that hidden layer, we have two other li linear layers that are going from the 400 hidden units into 20 units. Where, where one of those hidden layers is going to output the mean of this, of this, uh, of this distribution. And the mean, for, because z is a 20 dimensional vector, then the mean of the diagonal covariance, uh, the, the mean of the Gaussian is just another 20 dimensional vector. So then the network will just have a linear layer that out directly outputs the mean of that distribution. And then there's a parallel layer, which is also going to output the diagonal covariance matrix of that Gaussian distribution. And then again, because z is a 20 dimensional vector, then the covariance matrix is a, the full covariance matrix would be a 20 by 20 matrix. But because we made this simplifying assumption of diagonal covariance, then, the, then all the off diagonal entries are zero. So the only non zero entries on that matrix is the diagonal. So there's 20 elements along the diagonal. So then we just need to have our neural network then output sort of 20 numbers for the mean and 20 numbers for those elements of the diagonal along the, covari the diagonal of the covariance matrix. So that would give us this concrete architecture of, um, of an encoder network for this fully connected variational autoencoder. And now the decoder would look very something very similar. Then it's going to input a vector z, and then it's going to have a couple linear layers that will uh, output the, the mean and the covariance of the pixels themselves where we again use this simplifying assumption that the pixels are distributed according to a Gaussian distribution with uh, some mean that is output by the network and some diagonal covariance, which is output by the network. And of course, um, I, I've sort of omitted the fact that I've written down linear layers on the slide here, but of course, every linear layer should have some kind of nonlinearity between them. So that's kind of implied in this diagram. Okay, so then once we've got this sort of concrete architecture for a variational autoencoder, then we need to think about how to train it. So recall that we're going to train, oh yeah, question? Oh, so the, the dimension of the output, the decoder, is 768, because we assume that we're working with a 20, 28 by 28 image, and 28 by 28 is 768, unless I did the math wrong. Uh, it's, it, maybe I did the math wrong. What, what is it? 28 times 28? Seven, 784. OK, yeah, I did it. I, I messed up the multiplication. OK, thank you. Uh, it's more common to use 768, because 768 is like two, uh, 512 plus 256. So that's actually a pretty common number to use. So I think I just typed that and didn't actually multiply it. But thanks for pointing that out. OK, so then how do we actually train this thing now that we've got a concrete architecture? So then remember that our training objective is that we want to maximize this variational lower bound. And this variational lower bound looks kind of scary. It has an expectation. It has a KL divergence. And these are like things that we usually don't see in loss functions. But it turns out it's actually not as bad as it looks. So um, we can kind of walk through then what it actually looks like when we're training a variational autoencoder. So when we train a variational autoencoder, first we take uh, some mini batch of data, um, x here, which is our input data from our data from our training data set. And then we pass that input data or that mini batch of input data through our encoder network 
And that encoder network is then going to spit out a probability distribution over the latent variable z for, for, our in, for that input element x. And now, we, now immediately we can use this, this predicted probability distribution to compute this second term in the, in the, in the variational lower bound. So what is, this, what is this second term in the variational lower bound saying? It's, it's saying that we want to, to compute the KL divergence between two distributions. One distribution on the left here is this Q theta of Z given X. So that is the predicted distribution of Z um, that is predicted by the, the, the encoder network when we feed it with the, with the input data X. So that distribution is just this diagonal Gaussian that our encoder, that our encoder has spit out for us. And now the second, the second distribution, P of Z, is, a, is the prior distribution over the latent variable Z, which we decided is going to be some simple distribution like a unit Gaussian. Um, and that is not learned, that, that prior distribution over Z is something that we fix at the beginning of training. So now, we, all we need to do is compute the KL divergence between uh, this, this distribution that was output by the network, which is a diagonal Gaussian, and this prior distribution, which is a unit Gaussian. And now it's clear why we chose everything to be Gaussian, because if we all choose all these distributions to be Gaussian, then we can actually compute this KL divergence in closed form. So I don't want to walk through exactly the derivation here, but it turns out that um, if you sort of expand out the definition of the KL divergence, then by the fact that these two distributions are both diagonal Gaussians, then we can just compute this KL divergence in closed form. So then, uh, yeah, question? Yeah, the question is, um, can we choose sort of other prior distributions for P of Z? So I think in a classical variational autoencoder, we, we tend to use a, a unit Gaussian because it allows us to compute this term in closed form. But it's definitely an active area of research to choose other types of prior distributions for Z. Um, and the problem is that, so I, I, sometimes you'll see people you try to use like a Bernoulli distribution and then you have categorical latent variables, or maybe like a Laplacian distribution and that implies some like different sparsity pattern of the latent variables. So you definitely can choose different uh, prior distributions for Z in a variational autoencoder. Um, but uh, it, it, being able to compute this KL divergence term might become difficult depending on the particular prior distribution that you choose. Um, so we often use the, the Gaussian just for computational simplicity that it allows us to compute this term in closed form. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the question is, should we assume sort of different priors for different data sets? Yeah. Well, I think this is actually, that's actually a very interesting question because this, this prior is over the latent variables, right? So what does it mean if we have a diagonal Gaussian? And so one is that this prior is over the latent variables and the latent variables are not observed in the data set. The model is sort of learning the latent variable representation jointly with everything else. So actually, um, the choice of prior is sort of our way to tell the model what sorts of latent variables that we want it to learn. So then, when we if we choose this like diagonal, this unit, uh, this unit Gaussian as a prior, then that's telling the model that we want it to learn uh, latent variables which are independent because it's a because it's a diagonal Gaussian and that all have uh, zero mean univariance. Um, so I think that because the latent variables are being discovered jointly by the model for the data, that's why I think it's okay maybe to use the same prior distribution even for different data sets. Um, but again, it's sort of active area of research to try out different sorts of prior distributions in variational models. Yeah, question? Question is, um, could we train sort of Z different binary, uh, Z, di dimension of Z different binary classifiers instead of a diagonal Gaussian? Um, and I think that would be equivalent. But the difference is that um, we actually want to, we want to share the computation within the encoder network. So right now the variational autoencoder is kind of interesting because we've got sort of two levels of modeling inside the model. One is like the neural network, which is computing many layers, and the other is kind of the probabilistic formulation. So it's true that even though we want the, we're telling the model we want it to learn uh, a set of latent variables that are uncorrelated, the way that we're computing those means and standard deviations of those latent variables is through a neural network that is going to share a lot of parameters and a lot of weights through shared hidden layers. So I think it's a computational reason that we choose to do it in this way. Okay, so that gives us our, our first term of our, very, of our variational objective. And really what this, term, what this term is just saying is that we want the distributions which are predicted by the encoder to sort of match the prior that we've chosen. And the KL divergence is just penalizing the difference with disparity between the predicted distribution and the prior distribution. Okay, so then once we've got a prior, so that, 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 so that allows us to compute this first term of the loss. So then once we've got, um, now that we've got our distributions over those things, over those, over those latent variables Z, then we can sample from the predicted distribution 
to actually generate some concrete samples, Z, which are now sampled from the distribution which was predicted by the encoder network. And then we can take these samples, Z, and feed them to the decoder network. And now the decoder network is going to predict a distribution over the images, X. And now this, this leads us to our second term in the objective. So what does this second term in the objective say? Well, it's, we're taking an expectation, and this expectation, the variable over which we're taking the expectation is z, the latent variable, and the distribution over which z is drawn should be q theta of z given x. So, um, sorry, uh, q phi of z given x. So q phi of z given x is the predicted distribution over z that is predicted by the encoder q when presented with the input uh, with the, with, the, with the input, x, right? So then we feed, well, that, that's exactly what we've done, is that we've fed the input x to the encoder, we've gotten this distribution, z given x, and now we've taken uh, some samples from that distribution in order to have some sampling-based approximation to this, to this objective, right? So then this, this term is an, is, an, is an expectation, and the thing over which we're taking the expectation are latent variables which have been sampled according to the predicted distribution. Okay, so that's kind of the, the first half of, the, of, the, of this objective. And now the second question is, what is the thing inside the expectation? So now the thing inside that expectation is that we want to maximize the likelihood of the data x under the predicted distribution of the decoder when we feed it a sample z. So then we want to, uh, so then this is kind of an autoencoder objective, right? That, that basically this is a data reconstruction term. That it's saying that what we want to do is we take the data x we feed it to the encoder, we sample some, and then we get a predicted distribution over z. We sample some z according to the predicted distribution. We feed those samples back to the decoder, and now, we, and now, the, deco now the predicted distribution of the, z, of the decoder, um, under that predicted distribution uh, over x, the original data x should have been likely. So this is really a data reconstruction term. It means that if we take our data um, and then use it to get a latent code, and then use that, that same latent code the, uh, the original data should be likely again. So, that's, that, so this term is really why this is called an autoencoder, right? Because remember, an autoencoder was a function that tried to predict its input by bottlenecking through some latent representation. And that's exactly what this term is doing, except now it's sort of a probabilistic formulation of an autoencoder. But it looks exactly the same. It's a data reconstruction term. But now, um, then, then, then we can easily compute this, this, uh, this second term in the loss function, right? Because we've got some samples from our latent codes, and then we can run those samples through the decoder to get our distribution. And then we can just use a maximum likelihood estimate, uh, like a, a maximize the likelihood of the predicted data under the predicted distribution from the decoder. Um, so that we can, then we can compute this second term in the objective once we've gotten these predicted distributions uh, of x given z. And that gives us our full training objective for the variation autoencoder. So then uh, the kind of every forward pass in our variation autoencoder, we would have these two terms in the loss, and then we would use that to, to, train the, to train the two networks jointly. So then basically these two objectives are kind of fighting against each other, right? Because the, the, the blue term is this data reconstruction term. It's telling us that if we take the data, give it back to the latent code, and then get the latent code, it should be easy to reconstruct the data. But now the, the, the green term is kind of saying that the predicted distribution over the latent variables should be simple, and it should be Gaussian. So that's sort of put, putting some kind of constraint on the types of latent codes that the encoder is allowed to predict. Right? So then the, 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 the KL divergence is sort of like forcing the latent codes to be as simple as possible by forcing it to be close to this, this simple prior. And the data reconstruction term is um, encouraging the latent codes to contain enough information to reconstruct the input data. So somehow these two terms in the variational autoencoder are kind of fighting against each other. But then once this thing is trained, then of course we could uh, sample a reconstruction of our original data by sort of sampling from a, a new reconstructed data from this, uh, this final predicted distribution of the data. Okay, so then this is how you would train a variational autoencoder. But once it's trained, we can actually do some cool things. So one thing is that we can generate new data um, from the, to the trained variational autoencoder. So we can ask the variational autoencoder to just invent new data for itself that is sort of sampling from the underlying distribution from which the training data was drawn. So the way that we can do that is that we, we're going to use only the decoder. So here we're going to first sample a, new, a, a random latent variable from the prior distribution over z. 
Um, and then we'll take that random latent variable and then feed it to the decoder network to get a distribution over, the, over new data x. And then we can sample from that predicted distribution over new data x to give some, some invented sample from the, from the data set. So this means that after we've trained a variational autoencoder, we can use it to just like synthesize new images that are hopefully similar to the images that were seen in the training set. So now, for, now we actually get to see some, some example results of exactly this process. So now these are example images which have been synthesized from a variational autoencoder which has been trained on different data sets. So on the left, we see um, some examples where we, we, well, not me, but the authors of the paper, had trained some variational autoencoder on the CIFAR data set. And then these are now generated images which kind of look like CIFAR images that have been invented by the model. And now on the right, um, they've trained it on a data set of faces. And now you can see the model is kind of inventing new images um, new faces that kind of look similar to the faces that it had seen during training. So this is, um, this is like, a, it's a generative model, so we should be able to generate data. And that's exactly what we're doing here. But now another, like, but now another really cool thing we can do with variational autoencoders is actually play around with that, uh, that latent variable Z. So remember, we, um, in our, we, we forced some structure on the latent variables because we, we put a prior distribution that the model was supposed to, to to, to match over the latent variables. So in particular, with the, the fact that we chose the, the prior distribution to be an independent, to be a diagonal Gaussian, means that each of the latent variables should somehow be independent. So what this means is not, now um, here we're doing a visualization where we're varying two dimensions in this latent code and then feeding different, different latent vectors C to the decoder that will generate new images. And we can see that as we vary uh, on, on the horizontal direction, as we vary z2, uh, maybe the second dimension of the latent code, then the images kind of translate from a sort of smoothly transition from a 7 on the left to some kind of a slanted 1 on the right. And now uh, on the vertical direction, if we vary a different dimension of that latent code z, then we can see the generated images are going to smoothly transition from a 6 at the top, um, sort of down through 4s in the middle, through nines in the middle, and then down to sevens at the bottom. So now this, this is now something that we could, that this is now showcasing some of the power of the variational autoencoder over something like the pixel CNN. That because the variational autoencoder is not just learning to generate data, it's also learning to represent data through these latent, through these latent codes Z. And by manipulating the latent codes, we can then have some effect on the way that the data is generated. So that's a really powerful, um, aspect of the variational autoencoder that the, the, something like the, the, like the, the autoregressive models just, just can't do. So now another thing we can do with variational autoencoders is actually edit images. So we can take an input image and then modify it in some way using a variational autoencoder. So the way that we can do that is that first we need to train it on our data set. But then after training, what we can do is say we've got an image X that we'd like to edit somehow. Then what we can do is take that image X, pass it through the encoder of the variational autoencoder to now predict this latent code Z for that image X. And now we can sample a latent code from that predicted distribution. And now we can modify that latent code in some way, like maybe change around some of the values in that predicted latent code. And then we can take that edited latent code and feed it back to the decoder to now generate a, a new edited data sample X. So now because we want, and then why does this make sense? This makes sense because we wanted the latent codes to somehow represent some kind of higher order structure in the data. And the generative model is supposed to discover this higher order structure in the data through the latent codes by, through, through the process of maximizing this variational lower bound. So then, um, but then after it's trained, then we can actually edit images using variational autoencoders using this kind of approach. So then here we have like maybe some, some, uh, some initial image, which is a face, and then we take that initial image, feed it to our variational autoencoder to get the latent code for the face, and then we, are, we can then change around different elements of the predicted latent code and feed them back to the decoder to get a new uh, edited version of that initial image. So then you can see that maybe as we vary along the horizontal, along the vertical direction, as we're, then we're varying one dimension in that latent code, then we can see that at the top, the guy looks really angry and he's not really smiling at all. And at the bottom, he's sort of smiling and looks very happy. 
So somehow this, this one dimension of latent code somehow seems to encode something like the facial expression or the, the happiness level of the face. And now as we vary z2, um, which is a, a, along a, a horizontal direction, then we're, then we're editing, a, we're modifying a different dimension of this predicted latent code. And then you can see that the guy is actually like turning his face from one side to another. That somehow the model has learned to sort of encode the pose of the person's face into one of the dimensions of the latent code. And now by editing that dimension of the latent code, then we can actually edit input images using a variational autoencoder. Um, of course, it's important to point out that we have no control. We don't know up front which elements of the latent code will correspond to which properties of the input image. Those are decided by the model for itself. But by kind of playing around with them after the fact, then we can see that the model has sort of assigned, in many cases, some kind of semantically meaningful data to the different dimensions of that latent code. So here's another example from a, a slightly more powerful version of a variational autoencoder, where uh, we're doing this idea of image editing again. So then in the left column, we have the original image. Um, on the, next, the second column shows the, uh, the, the reconstruction of the original image, if we sort of take the unedited latent code and feed it back to the decoder. And then the, the next five columns are all showing uh, edited versions of that initial image, where we change one of the values in the predicted latent code. So then you can see on the left that um, by changing one of the dimensions in the latent code, we're again sort of changing the direction of the head. And now in the example on the right, we see that a different dimension of the latent code corresponds to the direction of the illumination, the direction of the light in the scene. So then again, this, this shows us how we can use um, sort of variational autoencoders to actually do image editing through these latent codes. And this, is a, and this is really kind of the reason why we want, like, variational autoencoders took a lot of ugly math, right? Like, it was a lot more complicated conceptually than something like the autoregressive models. But this is, the re this is the payoff right here, that we went through all that additional work with the variational autoencoder so that we could learn these useful latent codes for, for images in addition to, to uh, sampling from them. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of most of what we want to say about variational autoencoders. So then kind of the summary of variational autoencoders is that they're kind of a probabilistic spin on these traditional autoencoders. Um, that they're kind of a principled approach to generative models is kind of a good thing. And that they, they're really powerful because they learn these distributions over latent codes from the data itself. Now, one of the, one of the downsides of variational autoencoders is that um, they're not actually maximizing the data likelihood. They're only maximizing a lower bound to the data likelihood. So all the probabilistic stuff is sort of approximate when we're working with variational autoencoders. Um, another problem with, with variational autoencoders is that um, the generated images often tend to be a bit blurry. Um, and I think that has to do with the fact that we're making sort of diagonal Gaussian assumptions about the data when we're working with variational autoencoders. OK, so then so far, we've seen two different types of generative models. Um, we saw these autoregressive models that are directly maximizing the probability of the data, and they give us pretty high quality sharp images, but they're sort of slow, they don't give us latent codes, and we saw, variational, and we saw these variational autoencoders that um, maximize a lower bound, the, the images are kind of blurry, but they're very fast to generate images because it's just like forward paths through this, through this feed forward neural network. And they learn these very rich latent codes, which is very nice. So then, is there some way that we can just like get the best, best of both worlds and actually combine the autoregressive models with the variational models. Um, and this, I think, is a bit of a teaser. I don't want to go into this in too much detail. Um, but there's a very cool paper that actually will be presented at a conference next month that um, does this exact approach. So this is called a, a Vector Quantized Variational Autoencoder, VQVAE2. And kind of the idea is that we're, we want to get kind of the best of both worlds of both variational autoencoders and autoregressive models. So what we're doing is kind of on the left, First, we train some kind of variational autoencoder type method that learns a grid of latent feature vectors um, as sort of the first, that looks kind of like training a variational autoencoder, but rather than learning a latent vector, instead we learn a latent grid of feature vectors. And now on the right, once you've learned that latent grid of feature vectors, then we can use a pixel CNN um, to, as an autoregressive model that is, now doing, that is now an autoregressive model that operates not in raw pixel space, but instead operates in the latent code space. So then it's kind of like sampling a latent code, and then based on the predicted latent code, it steps to the next element in the grid, samples the next latent code, and so on and so forth. So this actually speeds up generation a lot. And now the hope is that it, this kind of will hopefully combine and give us the best of both worlds between variational autoencoders and pixel CNNs.
And actually, this model gives amazing results. So these are actually generated images using this vector quantized variational autoencoder model. So these are 256 by 256 generated images um, that are conditioned, that actually, this is a conditional generated model. So the model is conditioned on the class that it's trying to generate from. Um, but, the, but this model is super successful. It's able to generate really high quality images. So I think this is a pretty exciting direction of future research uh, for generative models. Um, so you can see that this model is able to generate really high quality, um, high resolution, 256 by 256 generated images when we train it on uh, even large scale complicated data sets like ImageNet. And now where this model works really, really well is actually on human faces. So these are actually generated faces. These are not real people. These are fake people that have been invented by this vector quantized variational autoencoder model um, that's working at this extremely high resolution of 1024 by 1024. And you can see that um, you know it's like it can model people with crazy hair colors. It can model like facial hair with a lot of detail. Um, these are also generated faces from this model. Um, so it's it's kind of astounding to me just how well this model is able to do in modeling these very complicated structures of, of people's faces. So I, so personally, I'm pretty excited about this as a possible future direction for generative models. But like I said, this paper is yet to be is will be presented at a conference next month. So it's sort of out in the air to see whether or not this will, this will become uh, the next big thing in generative models. OK, but this I, just, this I just wanted to serve as kind of a sneak peek as kind of state of the art in, uh, in uh, autoregressive and uh, variational models. So and kind of where we are so far in generative models is that you know, we've seen these autoregressive models that are directly maximizing the likelihood of the training data. Um, and then we've seen these variational autoencoder models that give up directly maximizing the likelihood of the data and instead, um, and instead maximize this variational lower bound. And this allows them to learn these latent codes jointly while maximizing this variational lower bound. Now, the, now, so now we need to talk about another category, another big category of generative models. And that's these generative adversarial networks, um, or GANs. So these are a very different idea. Here, we're going to completely give up on trying to model explicitly the density function of the images. So instead, we, we, don't, we no longer care about being able to compute um, the, the, the density over images or even some lower bound or some approximation to the density. Instead, with a, with a generative adversarial network, the only thing we care about is being able to sample data from some, some density of the, of the, all we care about is sampling. We don't care about actually writing down or spitting out the, the likelihood of our training data. So then, how do we do that? So then the kind of setup with, with uh, generative adversarial networks is that we assume that we've got some, some training data, Xi, some finite sample of training data that have been drawn from some true distribution of P data. So now P data of X is like the true probability distribution of images in the world. Um, and this density function is like the density function of nature. So there's no way that we can actually evaluate this density or write it down. But we just assume that uh, the natural images in our data set have been sampled from this, uh, de this like natural density of data. And now what we want to do is somehow learn a model that allows us to draw samples from P data. Um, but, and we don't actually care about evaluating the likelihoods. All we want to do is be able to draw new samples from this probability distribution P data. OK, so now the way that we're going to do this is that we're, we're like a variational autoencoder, we're going to introduce a latent variable Z. But the way that we use the latent variable Z is going to be a bit different. So here, we're going to, um, we're just like in variational autoencoders, we're going to assume latent variable z with some fixed prior pz. And this can be something simple, like a uniform distribution, or a diagonal Gaussian, or some other kind of simple distribution. So now what we want to do is we want to sample a, a latent variable z from our prior distribution, and then pass a sample through some function g, capital G, called the generator network. And by passing the latent variable through the generator network, it should output, it's going to output some sample of data x. And now, um, now, because of, now because now the generator network is G, is sort of implicitly defining some probability distribution over images that we're going to call P sub G. And P sub G, it's sort of difficult to write down that exact density. You'd have to use kind of like the change of variables function um, from probability distributions. But um, because, because the generator, we're like sampling some, some we're sampling some latents from the prior, 
passing the latent variable through the generator function, and that gives us a data sample x. So then the generator kind of implicitly defines this distribution p sub g over data samples. And now we can't explicitly write down the value of p sub g, but we can sample from p sub g because we just sample from the prior and then pass it through the generator. And now what we want to do is somehow train this generator network uh, g such that uh, this, the, p, the p sub g, which is implicitly modeled by the generator network, we want it to be equal to this true distribution p sub data uh, of the, 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 the distribution of the data coming from nature. So then pictorially, what this looks like is that we want to draw some sample z from this prior pz, feed it to our generator network g, and that will give us some generated sample. And then, um, what we, so then the generator's job is what it, it takes a prior from pz and turns it into a sample from pg. But now, what do we, now we need some mechanism to force pg to end up being close to p data. So then to do that, we're going to introduce a second neural network called the discriminator network. So what the discriminator network is doing is it's performing an image classification task. The discriminator network is going to input images um, and try to classify whether or not they are real or fake. And now, the, so then the discriminator network will be trained both on samples from the generator as well as on our real, our real samples from the data set. And then this is sort of a supervised learning problem for the discriminator network. We've got sort of samples from the generator that we know are fake. We've got samples from the real data that we know are real. And now the discriminator network should be trained to do a binary classification task to classify images as either real or fake. And now, uh, the gen and, but now we're going to actually train these two networks jointly. We're going to train the generator to try to fool the discriminator. So the discriminator is trying to learn whether classified images are as real or fake, and the discriminator is trying to get its images classified as real. So then intuitively, these two networks are kind of fighting against each other. The discriminator is trying to learn all the ways in which the, in which the generator's images look fake, and the generator is trying to learn how to have its images pass as realistic by the generator, or by the discriminator. So then hopefully, kind of the intuition is that if both of these networks get really good at their jobs, then hopefully uh, this PG will somehow uh, converge to P data. And hopefully, after, by, by training these two networks jointly, then hopefully the, the, the samples from the generator will end up looking a lot like the samples from the real data. And this is the intuition behind generative adversarial network. Now, kind of more concretely, the, the particular loss function that we use to train the gener generative adversarial network is, called, is this uh, following minimax gain between G and D. So there's this big, hairy objective function in the middle that we'll go through piece by piece. And now, we're, now the, the discriminator D is trying to maximize all the terms in this objective. And the generator G is trying to minimize all the terms in this objective. And now we can color code this a little bit based on our previous uh, picture to make these, each of these terms a little bit easier to understand. So then we can look at these, two, these, these terms one by one. So this first term is um, the expectation of x drawn according to p data. So that's just sort of, uh, then we can approximate this expectation by just uh, taking the sum or the average over the real the, our real data samples from our training set. Um, and now the, the discriminator, the, now this term the discriminator is trying to maximize this term. So the discriminator is trying to maximize log of dx. And dx is a number between 0 and 1. Log is a monotonic function. So what this term is saying is that when the, when the discriminator tries to maximize this term, it's trying to get the real data classified as real. That the discriminator is trying to make sure that the discriminator output on real data is 1. And the generator is trying to minimize this term. But this term does not depend on the generator. So in fact, the generator doesn't care about this term at all. This term is just saying that the discriminator is trying to correctly classify the real data as real. OK, now the second term is that the discriminator is trying to, ma again, maximize this term. So now again, this is an expectation. But the expectation is over latent variables z that have been drawn according to the prior pz. And now given, uh, given a sample of z from the prior, we're going to pass the latent variable through the generator to get a fake sample and then take that fake sample and pass it to the discriminator, which will give us a number between 0 and 1. So now the discriminator is trying to maximize this term, which means that this that log, is, log of something is maximized, when log of 1 minus something is maximized when the something is minimized, which means that the discriminator is trying to um, set d of x equal to 0 when, when x is a fake data. So this term, when the discriminator is maximizing this term, 
It's trying to make sure that the fake data is classified as fake, as a binary classification problem. Okay, but then we can look at this term from the generator's perspective. So the generator, remember, is trying to minimize this whole objective function. And now, the, so then the generator is looking at this exact same term in the objective, but trying to minimize it. So that means that the generator is trying to adjust itself such that the generated samples are classified by the discriminator as real. So that gives us our training objective for this, for this minimax game. So then the kind of idea is that we'll uh, train this thing using alternating gradient descent that will, will jointly train both the generator and the discriminator so that they're both trying to, one is trying to maximize this objective and one, the other is trying to minimize this objective. So then for notational convenience, we can write down that whole messy expression as V of G and D. And then our training objective is we run in a loop. And then for each, for each time in the loop, we, come, we want to first update the discriminator. So then we compute the derivative of the objective V with respect to the discriminator weights. And now we're trying to maximize the objective for the discriminator. So we want to do gradient ascent. So then we uh, move in the direction of the gradient and take a gradient step to do a gradient ascent step on D. And then once we update D, then we compute the gradient of the objective with respect to the generator weights. And now the generator is trying to minimize this objective. So then we need to take a gradient descent step on this objective to update the weights of the generator G. And then we'll just kind of update these two one after another, and we'll loop forever, and hopefully things will uh, end up happy. But it turns out there's actually a problem, right? That actually, um, you know, normally when you're training neural networks, you can just like look at the loss, and the loss is kind of going down like this, and that means you know that everything is working well. But uh, it turns out that's not the case at all for these generative adversarial networks. Because the loss of the two of the generator, like the, the generator has its own loss, the discriminator has its own loss, and they depend on each other, right? Because when the gen, for example, if the discriminator is really good and the generator is really bad, then the discriminator will have low loss and the generator will have high loss. But if the generator is really, but like the two losses sort of depend on each other in complicated ways. So when you're training generative adversarial networks, Usually the loss does not go down like this. Usually if you plot the losses of these two things, they're like all over the place. And you can't really, you can't really gain any intuition by looking at the loss curves when training these things. So training generative adversarial networks tends to be a pretty tricky process that I, I don't know if I can actually give you that great of advice on how to train these things properly. Um, but suffice to say, it's challenging. Okay, but there's actually kind of another problem here is that um, this, so this term on the right, this log of one minus d of g of z, um, we can actually plot this um, uh, as, a, as a curve. So here on the x-axis, we're plotting d of g of z, um, and on the y-axis, we're plotting log of one minus d of g of z. Um, and now, at the start of the training, you have to think about what's gonna happen at the very start of training. At the very start of training, the generator is probably gonna produce like random garbage. And then that random garbage will be very easy for the discriminator to tell whether it's real or fake. Because sort of classifying real data versus random garbage is very easy. The discriminator will usually get that within a couple gradient steps. So now at the very beginning of training, d of g of z is close to zero because the discriminator is like really good at catching the fake data. So then d of g, so then if uh, d of g of x is close to zero, that means that this term is like over here on this uh, uh, in this red this red arrow for the generator, and now that's really bad because the gradient is flat. So that means that at the very beginning of training, the generator will get almost no gradient. We'll have a, we have a vanishing gradient problem at the very beginning of training. So that's, a, that's, that's bad. So then to fix this, we actually, uh, in practice, we often, we train the generator to, uh, mi to minimize a different function. So rather, so in this, this sort of raw formulation that I've written up here, the generator is trying to minimize log of one minus d of g of z. But in practice, we want, we're, what we're gonna do instead is train the generator to maximize minus log of d of g of z, um, which is still has the same interpretation of having the generator's uh, data be classified as real, but the way that that's realized into, obje into the objective function is a little bit different. So now if we plot a minus log of d of g of z, we see that at the beginning of training, then the generator actually gets good gradients. So, that, so this is actually how we're going to train generative adversarial networks in practice. Um, that the, 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 the generator, the discriminator is trying to classify data as real as fake, the generator is trying to get its data classified as real by the discriminator, but the exact objective that the two are optimizing is a little bit different just to account for the Spanish gradient problem. Yeah, we want to minimize log of one minus d of g of z. So we want to maximize minus log of d of g of z, I think. Actually, maybe that should be, uh, maybe that should be a minimize. Yeah, I, th I, th I think you could be right. Let me double check and get back to me. Yeah. 
Okay, so then there's sort of, like, we have this intuition that generator is generator trying to fool discriminator, and there's a question of, like, why is this particular objective a good idea to, uh, to accomplish this goal? And now it turns out that this particular objective, this particular minimax game, actually achieves its global minimum when p of g is equal to p data. And now to see this, we need to do a little bit of math. So then here's our objective so far. Um, and we're kind of ignoring the fact that generator is actually optimizing a different objective. We're just pretending that they're both optimizing this, this one objective. So here's our objective so far. Now what we can do is we can do a change of variables on the second expectation. So now rather than writing it as an expectation over z drawn according to the prior, we can write it as an expectation of x drawn according to the p of g, which is this distribution that the generator is implicitly modeling. So then we're just kind of doing a change of variables on the second expectation. Now we can expand out these two, the, now we can expand out the definition of the expectation into an integral, um, and that gives us this expanded version. And now, um, if all of our functions are well behaved, we can push the max, we can exchange the order of the max in the integral and push the max inside the integral. And now we actually want to, we actually, now what we, what we have is that we want to actually compute this max. So the discriminator is trying to perform the maximum, um, but the integral is over all of x. So now we want to write down what is the optimal value of the discriminator for each possible value of x. So now we can do that with a little bit of side computation. So we can write down, uh, we can really recognize this, this thing inside the, the max as a function that looks kind of like a log y plus b log 1 minus y where a is p data of x, b is p g of x, and y is d of x. And now this, this function f of y, we can just compute the derivative, set it equal to zero, and then find, the, find that this function f has a local max at um, a over a plus b. So then we can kind of go back and plug that back in, and that, that tells us that, that gives us the, the value of the optimal discriminator. That is the discriminator which is actually satisfying this maximum inside the integral. So that the optimal discriminator, which is achieving this maximum value, um, depends on the generator. So now the optimal discriminator, d star, for the generator g, um, has its value of p data of x over p data of x plus p g of x. So that's the, the value of the optimal discriminator for any value of x. Um, so it's important to point out that we can compute that this is the optimal value for the discriminator, but we can't actually like evaluate this value. Right, because this, this, DG, this d star sub g of x involves p data of x, which we already can't evaluate, and involves p g of x, which we also can't evaluate. So this is kind of a, a nice mathematical formalism. We know that this is the value the optimal discriminator must take, but we can't actually compute that value because it involves terms that we can't actually compute. But then what we can do is sort of um, sub that, val that, that optimal discriminator back into the model, and that sort of eliminates that inner maximization. Right, so then we've sort of performed that inner maximization. We found the value of the optimal discriminator. Now we can plug in the value of that optimal discriminator um, in every term of that integral. So now we've got, um, now this is the same, the same objective function, but we've just kind of like done the inner maximization over the discriminator uh, for us automatically. Now this is getting messy, so let's push this up. And then, uh, then we can use the definition of expectation to sort of rewrite this integral back as a pair of expectations. So now, we, now we're sort of pulling this back out, and now we write this as two expectations. One expectation is x over p data of log of this ratio, and the other is x according to pg log of this ratio. Um, and this is, again, using the definition of expectation. Now we need to do a little bit of algebraic nonsense, multiply by a constant, pull it out, then we kind of pull out this log four, and then we end up with this particular mathematical formalism. This is getting messy, so let's push it up again. Um, and now, now this is something that, that maybe, uh, if you've taken enough information theory, you could recognize this as an important term. Um, so now, there, it turns out there's this thing called the kolak libor divergence, or KL divergence, which somehow measures the distance between two probability distributions. And now we can recognize that we've actually got two KL divergence terms sitting here, right here. So then by the definition of the KL divergence, um, it's over a distribution P and a distribution Q, and then it's the expectation of X drawn according to P of log of the ratio between them. And now we can see we've got two KL divergence terms sitting right here inside these two expectations. So then we can rewrite this as uh, there's the two KL divergence. One is the KL divergence between P data and this average of P data and PG. The other is the, uh, look the other way, the average of PG and this average distribution. And we saw this log four hanging out. Now we can recognize another uh, sort of fact from information theory. There's another distribution we can recognize called the Jensen-Shannon divergence, 
which is yet another way to measure distances between different probability distributions. And the Jensen-Shannon divergence is just defined in terms of the KL divergence. And now we can see we've actually got a, a Jensen-Shannon divergence sitting right here on this equation. So then we can simplify this even further and write down this whole objective as just this Jensen-Shannon divergence between uh, P data and PG. So that means that um, now this is actually quite interesting, right? Because we've taken this like minimax objective function that we're trying to minimize and maximize. We reshuffle things. We actually computed the maximum with respect to the discriminator. And then we boiled this all down. So now we just need to find, so then this whole objective reduces to the minimum of the Jensen-Shannon divergence between the true data distribution P data and the implicit distribution the generator is modeling PG minus this constant log four. And now there's an amazing fact about the Jensen-Shannon divergence that I'm sure you're all aware of, is that the Jensen-Shannon divergence is always not negative. So it's always greater than or equal to zero. And in fact, it only achieves zero when the two distributions are equal. So that means that, the, that, that, that now this whole expression, we were trying to minimize, find the generator that minimizes this expression. And it turns out that the unique minimizer of this expression occurs when P data is equal to PG, QED. Right? So that means that um, the optimal, so the, the unique, that means that the global solution, the global, the global minimizer of this whole objective happened. So then kind of summarizing this, we kind of rewrote this whole thing as this, uh, minim, as, this, uh, as this minimization function. Now the summary of all this is that the overall global minimum of this minimax game happens is that um, when the discriminator assigns this particular value, this, this particular ratio um, to all of, to any data sample, and then when the, when the generator just models directly the true data distribution. So that's kind of the beautiful math that underlies why generative adversarial networks have the potential to work and why training with this minimax objective um, actually has the capacity to cause the generator to learn the true data distribution. But of course, there's a lot of caveats here, right? So that um, this, this is sort of a, a proof that makes us feel good, but it's, there's some holes in this when it comes to applying this proof in practice. So one is that, in fact, um, we've kind of done this minimization assuming that G and D can just represent any arbitrary function. But in fact, G and D are represented by neural networks with some fixed, fixed and finite architecture, and we're only allowed to optimize the weights. So it's possible that the optimal the generator and the optimal discriminator just might not be within the space of expressible functions for our generator and discriminator. So that's a problem. So it doesn't actually tell us whether or not fixed architectures can represent these optimal solutions. And it also doesn't tell us anything about convergence. So this does not tell us about whether we can actually converge to this solution in any kind of meaningful amount of time. So I, I think this, this proof is nice to be aware of. It shows us that, P, that, that we are hopefully learning the true distribution, but there's sort of a lot of uh, caveats left. Okay, so that's hopefully enough math for one lecture, and let's look at some pretty pictures. So then uh, here's some results from the very first paper on generative adversarial networks back in 2014. And you can see that um, back in 2014, we were able to generate these generative adversarial network samples that could um, reproduce faces to some extent and reproduce these images, to, uh, these, uh, these handwritten digits to some extent. Um, and then for comparison, we're showing the nearest neighbor in the training set uh, for one, each of these generated samples. Um, so the fact that the nearest neighbor is not exactly the same as the generated image means that this uh, model is not just regurgitating training samples, that it's hopefully learning to generate new samples that just look like plausible training, like plausible uh, samples from the training set. Okay, so this was kind of um, the beginning of generative adversarial networks, but this was 2014, five years ago, and this is a fast moving field. So we've got a lot of advancements since then. So then kind of the first really big successful result in generative adversarial networks was this uh, so-called DCGAN architecture which use a, like a five layer convolutional network for both the generator and the discriminator. Um, and they got this thing to train actually much better than some of the original papers. And now some of the generated samples from DCGAN ended up looking quite nice. So here what we're doing is we're training DCGAN on a data set of image of photos of bedrooms. And now we're sampling new photos of bedrooms from a trained DCGAN model. And you can see that these generated samples are actually quite complicated. They're capturing a lot of structure of bedrooms. You can see that there's like beds and windows and furniture and a lot of interesting structure being captured by this generative model. But what's even cooler about this, 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 uh, these networks is that we can do interpolation in the latent space. So remember that a generative adversarial network is taking a latent variable Z and then passing it to the generator to generate a data sample X. 
So now what we can do is we can sample a z over here and a z over here, and then linearly interpolate a bunch of z's in between, and then feed each of those linearly interpolated z's to the generator to now generate interpolated images along this, uh, this latent path in the latent space. So then each row in this figure is showing us an interpolation in latent space between uh, one bedroom on the left and a different bedroom on the right. And you can see that the images are somehow like continuously warping into each other in a really non-trivial way. So that suggests that this adversarial network has learned something really non-trivial about the underlying structure of bedrooms. And it's not just doing like an alpha transparency blend of the two images, it's like learning to warp the spatial structure of those images into each other. Another really cool thing we could do with generative adversarial networks is some kind of vector math on these latent vectors. So what we can do is we um, can sample a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of samples from the network and then sort of manually categorize them into a couple different categories. So here on the left, we've got a bunch of samples of uh, smiling women. They look kind of like smiling women if we look at the generated images. In the middle, we've got sort of non-smiling women. On the right, we've got non-smiling men. And then each of the, for each of these data samples, we have the latent vector which generated it. So then for each of these different columns, we can compute the average latent vector along the column and then uh, re, re, re feed that average latent vector back to the generator to generate kind of an average smiling woman, an average neutral woman, and an average neutral man from according to this trained model. And now we can do vector math. So what happens if we take a smiling woman, subtract a neutral woman, and then add a neutral man? Smiling man, there we go. <laughs> and then you could sort of sample some new vectors around that smiling man vector and sort of get other smiling man images. Or we could do something similar, take man with glasses, minus man without glasses, plus woman without glasses. What are we going to get? Woman with glasses, there we go. <laughs> so then somehow these uh, generative adversarial networks let us do some kind of semi-interpretable vector map in latent vector space, which is really cool. So this was in 2016, and I think after this paper, people got really, really excited about generative adversarial networks. And the field went crazy. So this is a graph showing the number of GAN papers as a function of year from 2015 to 2018. And you can see that the number of GAN papers being published is just like exploding at a ridiculous rate. Um, so there's a, there's a website called the GAN Zoo where they try to keep track of all the different papers that are being published about GANs. So here, um, I, I sort of took a screenshot of the GAN Zoo. This goes through B, and they're alphabetized. So there's a, the, the, the GAN Zoo just captured like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of research papers that are being written about GANs. So there's no way that we can possibly talk about all the advancements in GANs since 2016. But I wanted to try to hit a couple of the highlights. So one is that we've um, got improved loss functions for GANs now. So uh, now we, there, there's an improvement called the Wasserstein GAN, which, is tr which uh, sort of changes the loss function that we use for, generating GAN, uh, for, for training GANs. And you can see that as we use this Wasserstein loss function, then the generated samples tend to work or tend to be a little bit better. Another thing we've gotten better at is improving the resolution of images with GANs. So uh, here are some samples from this model called the Progressive GAN, which was published just last year in 2018. So the Progressive GAN, on the left, we're showing 256 by 256 generated images of bedrooms on the same bedroom data set that we've, been, that we've been working on. So these are like fake images of bedrooms, and these look like I would, like I would stay there if that was on Airbnb. Um, those look pretty good. Uh, and on the right, we're seeing these high resolution 1024 by 1024 generated faces by this progressive GAN architecture. But of course, that was 2018, and we're in 2019, so things have gotten even better since then. So then the same authors behind progressive GAN wrote this new one called Style GAN, which was published just this year in 2019, which is also pushing towards higher resolution. So here are some results of Style GAN generating images of cars, which, I don't know, look pretty realistic to me. And on the right are, again, 1024 by 1024 generated faces using this style GAN model. And now what's really cool is we saw that GANs could be used for interpolation in latent space. Well, we can apply interpolation in latent space to these higher resolution faces that are being generated by style GAN. So you can see that uh, style GAN is kind of like learning to warp in, by, by warping, by continuously moving the latent vector in that Z in latent space. You can see that the generated faces are kind of continuously deforming into each other. So the fact that, this, that the transitions between the faces are so smooth gives us a very strong indication that this model is not memorizing the training data. Oh no, this model seems to be learning some important structure of the generated faces. 
because otherwise there's no way it could possibly interpolate between them in such a smooth way. So, these, so this is sort of like 2019 GANs, or early 2019 GANs. Okay, so then uh, another thing we might want to do is do conditional GANs. So all of these samples we've seen so far have been unconditional. We train it on a data set, and then we just sample to get new images from that data set. But what we, what we might want to do is be able to get more control over the types of images that are generated from GANs. So to do that, we can use a conditional generative model and, and model uh, the, the, the distribution of X, the, the image X, conditioned on some label Y. So then the way that we do that is we change the architecture of our generator to input both the, the, the random noise Z along with the label Y in some way. And the particular way that we tend to inf input the label information into GANs these days is this trick called conditional batch normalization. So we know, so recall we have batch normalization on the left. Remember in batch normalization, we're always gonna do a scale and a shift and then multiply by uh, a learned, uh, we do the normalization of the data and then we um, add and multiply by a learned scale and shift gamma and beta. So now what we do is we learn a separate gamma and beta for each, for each category label Y that we want the model to, to model. So then the way that we input the, la the label Y into the generator is just by swapping out a different uh, gamma or beta um, that we learn separately for each class. And this seems like kind of a weird trick, but it actually seems to work quite well in fusing label information into GANs. So then, once we, once we have this trick of conditional batch normalization, we can train conditional GANs. So then, these are, um, this is an example of a conditional GAN model, which was trained on ImageNet, but now, rather than just inputting random noise, we actually tell the generative model which category we want it to generate. So then on the left, we have generated uh, Welsh Springer Spaniels. In the middle, we have generated fire trucks. And on the right, we have generated daisies. And all these images are generated from the same model, but we control which type of category we want it to generate by feeding different, uh, different Ys to the model. And this paper also introduced this new normalization method called spectral normalization, which we can't get into. Um, we've seen actually self-attention be really important for different types of applications throughout the semester. Um, we saw this in transformers. We saw this uh, also uh, in, in other contexts. And it turns out that self-attention is also useful for GANs. So if we put self-attention into our big GAN models, then we can train even better conditional GAN models on ImageNet. So again, these are all conditional samples from the same GAN model, but we're telling the generator which category we want it to generate from at test time. And now here, I think, is the current state of the art in um, GAN technology is the so-called Big GAN paper from uh, Brock et al. that was just published earlier this year in 2019. So these are all, these are again conditional samples. These are generated images from, uh, from a, a, a conditional GAN model that was trained on ImageNet. And now these are 500 and 512 images um, that are all generated from the same model, but where we tell the generator which category we want to generate at test time. So I think the, if you want to read, if you want to understand all the latest and greatest tricks to get your GANs to work really well, I think this is the paper to read right now. So then of course, uh, GANs don't have to stop with images. Um, there's some initial work on generating videos with GANs. Um, so this uh, here on the left are some generated videos from GANs where we're generating 48 frames of 64 by 64 images um, using some kind of uh, GAN model. And on the right, we're generating 128 by 128 images and only 12 frames. So I think this is maybe the next frontier in GAN technology. So hopefully we'll come back in 2020 and like have, be able to see even more beautiful videos like this. So then it turns out people want to use GANs to generate more, to condition on more types of information than just labels. So there's been work on where we, wanna, where we want to train models that are P of X given Y, where Y is not just a category label, but is some other type of information. So that Y can be a whole sentence. So there's work that tries to input a sentence and then outputs uh, an image using a GAN, using some kind of conditional GAN model. Um, we can also have that conditioning variable Y be an image itself. So one example is image super resolution. So we're going to input a low resolution image as the conditioning variable Y, and then have the model output a realistic high resolution image um, as the output X. So then here, the, the, the bicubic would be the input X, which is or the input Y, which is a low resolution input. And then the, the, the GAN generator will then output this, uh, this high resolution uh, upsampling of the image. We can also do image editing with GANs. So we can uh, train GANs that convert like uh, so different types of image. We can train, train GANs that can, for example, convert Google Street View images into Street View map images, or convert semantic label maps into real images, or convert sketches of handbags into real handbags. 
And we can do all of these with some kind of conditional GAN formulation. A really famous example of this is this so-called cycle GAN work that is actually able to train these translations in an unpaired way, which I think we don't have time to get into. But what's really cool is they can sort of train these GAN models that can convert images of horses into images of zebras using some kind of conditional GAN formulation. So then here, the input Y is the image of a horse, and the output X is the image of a, is the image of a zebra. And they're able to train, they found a very clever way to train this thing even when we don't have sort of paired couples of zebra images and, and horse images. We could, there's also work on converting label maps to images. So here the input, there's sort of two inputs Y. One is the layout of the scene that we want on the top. So then like the blue is the sky, the green is the grass, and the, the purple, like the, 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 the maroon is the clouds. And then on the left is a second input Y that gives us the type of artistic style that we want that image to be rendered in. So then we can train a GAN model that then generates images which match the layout given by the semantic map, but also match the artistic style of the, the input style images on the left. So then there's, this is just a, there's just a whole wide world of work on different types of models that we can build with GANs. And then I'd also like to point out that GANs are not just for images. We can actually use GANs for just generating any type of data, really. So this is a paper that I did last year where we want to use GANs to generate uh, predictions of where people might want to walk in the future. So the input to the model is some uh, history of the previous few seconds where a, where a group of people are walking. And what it tries to predict is where the people will walk going into the future. And we can train this up as some kind of conditional GAN model, where the conditioning variable Y is kind of the past of where people are walking, and the generated data X is the future of where they will walk. And this needs to be uh, realistic as judged by, by the discriminator. So kind of the summary of GANs is that uh, you know, we're kind of jointly, jointly training these two networks, the generator and the discriminator, um, and that under some assumptions, um, the, the generator learns to capture the true, uh, the, the true data distribution. And then if we kind of like zoom out this taxonomy of generative models, now at this point we've seen these three different, we've seen uh, three different uh, types, three very different flavors of generative models uh, with neural networks. So we've seen these autoregressive models that are going to directly maximize the likelihood of the data. We've seen these variational models that are going to jointly learn these latent variables, z, together with the data x and maximize this variational lower bound. And we saw these generative adversarial networks um, which uh, give up totally on modeling P of X and instead just want to uh, learn to draw samples. Um, and these GAN models, as we've seen, have tons and tons of applications and they can be used to generate really, really high quality images. So that's pretty much all we have to say about generative models. Um, and then next time, we'll talk about uh, me mechanisms for dealing with non-differentiability inside your neural network models. So that will lead us to some discussion on stochastic computation graphs, and I think we'll also touch a little bit on reinforcement learning as well. So come back, as, come back on that, and hopefully get started on your homework before then too.